Hey everyone, it's Dr. Anita, founder of thefreedomprescription.com. Head on over there when we start stop this video and make sure you sign up for uh, my newsletter and get the free 43-page ebook where you learn how to manage your stress and how to be more productive with your time, all that good stuff. So it's thefreedomprescription.com. But before you head over there, I want to confront this issue about Brian Williams, which is there's actually some very funny memes going around, and I've posted a couple on my Facebook page because honestly they're hysterical. But I do want to use this opportunity to educate people about a little bit of, about possibly what could be going on with Brian Williams and what happens with all of us at a certain point. Um, because what Brian Williams did is something that everybody does to a certain degree. He actually ratcheted up several notches. Uh, and I'll tell you about that in a few minutes here about why that happens and or possibly and you know of course I need to give a disclaimer never met Brian Williams I haven't evaluated him it's not about him specifically but about what he did and um, what we can learn about this about ourselves and about our brains and our own memory what happened with, was he claimed that he had been in a helicopter he actually had a several claims um, that have been proven wrong one is that he was in a helicopter that was shot down by a um, an RPG in Iraq and back in 2003 or 2004 he repeated the story over and over again and just recently he admitted that he wasn't actually in the uh, um, helicopter that was shot down he was in a helicopter that was following that it was like an hour behind and he said he misremembered it and he used the word conflated uh, meaning that he took his own personal experience of being in the helicopter and then the rather traumatic experience which we have to admit would have been probably traumatic to see the wreckage of a helicopter that went down just an hour before you had have, um, uh, had been there so he kind of took these two experiences and in his imagination imagined what it may have been like to be in a helicopter that had been shot down and fused those two experiences and then it became his memory which of course is not what really happened but that's his memory and he at least he claims that's what happened that's what his memory is and we you know have to go with what he says and I do believe he thinks he did that and I'll tell you about that in a couple of minutes what I want you to know and what's relevant oh by the way he also did uh, claim during the Hurricane Katrina when he covered that as a journalist he claimed that he saw a dead body float down Bourbon Street well Bourbon Street wasn't flooded so that was completely impossible again was that a con memory conflation or was that a lie I don't know uh, we could decide I suppose you I'll let you figure out what happened there but what this is bringing to light though is what happens to all of us with our memory how we process information about things that we experience what I want you to know about this is how unbelievably unreliable our own recollections can be and it's a little bit disconcerting when you really stop and think about it because we like to think that our our memories are very accurate um, but the evidence shows and maybe your own personal experience can show that that's not the case what happens is when we look out on something and we are experiencing something the way we interpret what we are experiencing has a lot of influences we have what I call filters in our brain and these filters teach us what we focus on and what we don't focus on what we choose to see and what we choose to not see two people can experience the very same event and have vastly different perceptions about what happened and some of its legitimate because for instance if I witnessed an accident happening um, at an intersection perhaps and maybe someone was on the intersection catty corner, catty corner to me and had watched the same accident they would have a different viewpoint a different angle certainly and were, would have been privy to different information than what I had when I witnessed the same accident however you assume that both people are looking at the same point at which the accident happened at that same time but that's unlikely that that happened let's say two people are on opposite corners and an accident's about to happen if it were me I may have been looking around I may have been looking up at some buildings or something and then I maybe heard squealing tires and that made me look down here and then I saw cars crash the other person perhaps on the other side of the intersection could have been staring at the intersection the entire time maybe because they were waiting to cross the street so they were looking at the whole the entire sequence of events and I wasn't yet we both saw the impact but our perceptions of what happened are going to be very different because things happen really fast your brain is trying to process what you actually saw and the way it processes what you saw is it tries to go back in its own history in your brain's own history to say well what should have happened here what didn't happen 
Um, you know, what do I need to be paying attention to now? Do I need to move into action? Like you're thinking about yourself when you see things like that happen, as well as th thinking about what's actually happening in front of you. All of this stuff is your brain is really on high alert and it's trying to process a huge amount of information in a very short period of time. So your brain has to be very selective about what it chooses to not let in to focus on. And what it chooses to not let in can be random. You don't know. You don't know what you're missing out on, what you're not perceiving. And then the other person who might be seeing the same exact experience not only is a different angle and was looking at something different entirely than what you were, but they have their own unique brain situation, so they're going to be focused on certain things and not focus on other things based on just random stuff that happens in the brain. So two people can see the same exact thing but have vastly different interpretations about what actually happened. So that's one aspect to memory. So they both walk away from the same experience but with very different memories of it for a lot of different reasons. And it can seem weird because the memories can be contradictory. And that's where when they look at um, uh, eyewitness accounts for crimes, for instance, that's where it really helps to have multiple people because that's when you look at, okay, well, this one person is saying this one thing, but we have so many more people who are saying the exact opposite. And the thing is, the person who's saying that one thing, they could really believe that that's what their memory was of that event. But it is possible that it wasn't what their memory was. It could have been what they wanted it to be because that's another component that when we are engaged with reality, sometimes we're actually in a fantasy part of our brains when we're supposed to be focusing on reality because sometimes what's happening in front of us is so disturbing that we part of our brain shuts down to try to not have all of that at you because it's very intense. And that could have been part of what happened with Brian Williams. He was a, a foreign correspondent and they see horrible things. It's, you know, that's, that's a field that is, these people see horrendous things in addition to the first responders and the military who see these things too. The journalists do too who are over there. They're exposed to horrible things and they can have problems with PTSD. So anyway, the brain is trying to preserve your mind. It's trying to keep you safe and shield you from things that are going to harm you. So it actually can, you can go into kind of a fantasy mode so that you don't input the enormity of what happened. That could have, that could explain a little bit of what happened with Brian Williams. He saw the wreckage of the helicopter and that could have just been so disturbing that his brain just kind of selectively, you know, chose bits and pieces and then he kind of was trying to put it all together in his mind and that's where the term conflation comes in and that is what he did. Now it could also be that he just made it up. Um, you know, I don't want to say one way or another, but the reality is that we all do this with, with our memory of events. Okay. We, we, we don't, we kind of try to fill in the blanks. We don't know exactly what we saw, especially if it was something traumatic or something really exciting, even too, it can, it can be a good thing. Uh, but if it's really intense, sometimes our brains kind of shut down to moderate the amount of intensity that actually comes into our minds. So that means you're not paying 100% attention to everything that's going on during the whole length of whatever it is that you're experiencing, all right? Now another problem with memory is that memory has what's called a snowball effect. And what that means is that if you think of a snowball that starts at the top of a, a snowy mountain and it starts very tiny and if you push it down the mountain, as it goes down, it's going to collect more and more snow as it rolls down the hill. And by the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, it's going to be a huge, huge snowball, that massive one, not just much bigger than the, one, the small one that it was when it started. Our memories function in much the same way. So we experience something. And then when we go tell somebody about that experience, we might um, misremember something and we might fill in that gap in what we didn't notice when we were watching the event that happened. And we fill that tiny little gap in with just maybe a little, I don't know, something that didn't really happen or just a white lie maybe even. We insert it in there uh, because we don't know how to tell the story in, that makes sense without having that little piece there and it makes a better story so we just kind of insert something there and the problem is then that the more and more we tell it we tell it with that inserted piece there that becomes our memory of the story not what actually happened and this can happen over and over over time another thing another dynamic in forming memory is that when you tell somebody about what happens they respond to it and with their response that helps you moderate what you say next. And so sometimes you can take on that person's comments or their interpretation or their reaction and make that 
part of your memory. So they might ask you a question about something that you didn't even think about during that same experience, and you might think of an answer and like, wow, I didn't even think about that. Then the next time you tell that story, you might just kind of insert that in there because you realize, well, that must have been something that I should have been aware of when I was experiencing this, so I probably was, and I'll just tell it. And so memory grows, and it kind of picks stuff up each time you tell it and each time you think about it and then it gets solidified and it becomes a story and a very firm memory in your head but it doesn't actually resemble what what happened in in the beginning uh, we used to think that memory was like a snapshot almost like your brain takes a a picture of what happened and that it's accurate and that's not at all what happens our experience of the world all the time is not we're not fully engaged with the world all the time, even though we're awake and we're conscious. Sometimes we're off in la-la land. We're fantasizing about something. We're dreaming about something. We're planning something. We're thinking about something. So we're not aware of what's going on around us. Not, at least not 100%. You're kind of aware, but not really. And so you think you're supposed to have a memory of what happened, but you don't because you weren't really paying attention to it. But you, it may sometimes be embarrassing to admit that you weren't paying attention and so you try to you know cover your cover that up by you know conflating uh, what you think probably was happening based on the little pieces of information that you were aware of and you were just kind of fill in the fill in the blanks on your own and it becomes a memory but you weren't actually paying attention so memory is really really tough so in the situation with Brian Williams so some people have what psychologists call a very active internal experience. That's the, the terminology that psychologists sometimes use. It just means they daydream a lot, and it means that they live in their heads more than maybe the average person. And they are prone to telling stories, for lack of a better way of saying it. And it's tough to know if they really believe it or if it's meant for deception. Um, you know, who knows? You don't really ever know someone's intention or what's in their heart. But what comes across, though, is that you can't trust that person because whether they're intentionally trying to be deceptive or whether they really believe these things, when they're confronted in the face of the fact that it didn't really happen and they're forced to apologize for it, they, I, I really do believe he was remorseful. I, I don't, I mean, I think he was sincere with that. But if that's how he thinks, if he tends to be more internal and, and take external experiences and really try to put himself there, maybe that's not a great quality for a journalist to have. So we need to think about those things. But there are people who live more in their mind than other people. We all do that, by the way, every one of us. We, we live more in our own internal experience than we do perceiving what's actually happening in front of us. This is just how our minds work. So now, just like with everything else, it exists along a continuum. You have people like maybe Brian Williams is, I don't know, like I said, who really live so much in their own minds um, that they, they fill in a lot of gaps with things that didn't really happen, and that's that's just what they do. Um, so it's, it's a really tough situation. So I wanted to use this as an opportunity to teach you a little bit about memory, a little bit more about how your mind works and how your brain works, so that as you're going through your life, you can start you know, understanding why it is that you don't remember things and maybe don't always feel um, like you have to explain yourself if you don't remember something. Just admit it. I mean, don't feel the need to fill in the blanks if you don't have them. There's a very strong social pressure. We don't want to feel like um, we don't want to feel foolish. We don't want to, people to perceive us as being unaware or out of touch. And so we are, we will fill things in that we don't, that we're just making stuff up um, because we don't want to be perceived in a certain way. I would just tell you, look, be honest, you know, if you if you don't know a detail, don't make one up. Just say, you know, I don't really, I'm kind of fuzzy about what happened between this uh, event and that event, and I wish I could remember, but I really can't. I'm really fuzzy. I'm, I do know this happened, I know that happened, but not what happened in between. So just, just acknowledge it. Be, you know, it's okay. It really is okay. I mean, you're, you're not going to come across as being um, uh, out of touch because everyone's out of touch <laughs> at a certain level. None of us are 100% fully engaged all the time, at least. So anyway, I hope this was educational for you. I, you know, usually I say I hope this was helpful for you. I don't know, you know, maybe you will find this helpful or maybe you'll just find it interesting. I don't know, whatever. I hope that this was entertaining. I'll say that for you. Uh, and I do look forward to chatting with you next time. If you have any questions about things that you see out in the, in the world that you want a psychologist's opinion about, maybe explain what's going on a little bit, 
shoot me an email, message me on Facebook, or right on my, my business page, my Dr. Anita page. I'd be happy to answer your question um, and give you, shed you a little bit of light on, on something that you might be interested in knowing. So now that you're done with this video, go ahead and give it a, uh, a like and share. And um, if you think about putting on Google, Google+, Plus, that'd be great. Maybe just share it with anybody else that you think might be interested in it. And you can also head on over to thefreedomprescription.com, and I'll see you next time.